Hi. Um, I have a couple of comments on this first slide, which you see. So the work with uh, Saint Leben and Van Proen is in progress, and this is maybe the most uh, essential technical part of the story. Um, and then the second one also work in progress about the role of SP2 uh, and duality in quantum theory. And those of you who know the Hamiltonian story, you know that symplectic symmetry is the Hamiltonian. And all the dualities, electromagnetic dualities, which I'll discuss, they always come in doublets. And I was trying hard to build the Lagrangian pass integral and I couldn't. And then the Hamiltonian just worked perfectly simply because the, those are symplectic symmetries. And so I have a short, um, uh, very short uh, version of the story here, if you are curious. And it is also based on my slightly more recent, uh, earlier work, uh, which is, is 4D maximum supergravity special. And I am saying, yes, I will have more evidence for you today, as well as tests which people in amplitude may decide to do. And also um, there is a recent work uh, where I uh, studied word amplitudes in super amplitudes in all dimensions, and it just came out. So the abstract is that um, you may have heard that U-duality imposes constraints on structure of UV divergences. And there was uh, also Gayar Zumina symplectic symmetry. Uh, and precisely in 4D, it has many more symmetries than U duality. For example, in N equals 8 in maximal case, it is SP56 uh, with uh, dimension 1596, whereas E77 is 133. And it is this difference which is relevant. Now, in all D greater than four, maximal duality is precisely U duality. There are no more, no extras. And so what I'll argue that these extra dualities, which enhance U dualities, they determine the properties of quantum supergravity. Once we implement them in the Hamiltonian pass integral, and therefore, the presence or absence of enhanced dualities suggests a possible explanation of known amplitude loop computation in d dimensional n greater than four supergravities. And as of now, there is a special role of d equals four. And so the, the short summary is that enhanced duality explains enhanced cancellation for n greater than four in four dimensions. And so uh, punchline, more 4D supergravity amplitudes are desirable. And the new amplitude computation will show that either perturbative 4D supergravity is as bad as all theories at higher dimension, which we already know. Perturbative supergravities are uh, at higher dimension, all UV divergence. Or we will see a continuation of the current story that um, there are enhanced symmetries and therefore enhanced cancellations, and that would be really interesting to find out. So <clears throat> I'll start with the story uh, of geometric superinvariants, which are written as um, integral over the whole superspace, and then dimensional analysis. So those supergravities typically come with G over H coset space, where G is a global U duality and H is a local H symmetry, which is a maximal compact subgroup of G. And so the analysis showed that there is a critical dimension uh, such that below it, there are no super invariants which do have local H symmetry and global H symmetry. And this is the, oops. This is the, table. Um, so those are um, maximum supergravities and predictions of critical loop order. And those are computation by Seaburn and many other people. And there is an empty place here. But what you see that 
everywhere the actual EV divergence is below L critical, which means one simple thing, sorry. That um, local H symmetry and global G symmetry are broken because of all these divergences. And here we don't know. In principle, local uh, critical dimension is N. And so we have not seen those so far. So all D greater than four UV divergences are at loop order below critical. And this means they predict local H symmetry and G symmetry must have anomalies. It just, uh, I take the data from amplitudes and I make a statement. So Kramer and Julia, back in 79, they did gauge fix local SU8, which is H symmetry, in symmetric gauge. And they also talked about Iwasawa gauge. And then they said the choice of the gauge is up to user. 11 dimensional people seem to like Iwasawa. Now in this paper with um, Sam Tleben and Van Pruen, we did gauge fixing of various versions of D-dimensional supergravity in various gauges. And so we agree with Kramer and Julia, the choice of a gauge is up to the user our quantum theory is consistent only if these gauges give the same S matrix. And therefore, we have to study gauge equivalence. So the local H symmetry must be anomaly free for the S matrix to be independent of user's choice. And this is a topic of, of this discussion. So let's start with this uh, tale of two supergravities in dimension D. I start with uh, Bernard Julia famous mechanism called group disintegration. As you see, in D equals four, you have E88, then you go up in dimensions, and there are smaller and smaller uh, exceptional groups. And the rumor is that his father was a pure mathematician, and those books were on the shelf in the house. This is how he discovered it uh, for physics. Now, it is not widely recognized that there are two different types of supergravities in dimension D with the same amount of local supersymmetry. Number one are just the one which have this G over H in dimension D. And then you can gauge fix it in symmetric gauge. And this is where uh, they all have non-polynomial dependence. Or supergravities of type two, much less known, and they are just dimensionally reduced from higher dimensions without dualization. Therefore, as you see, uh, the symmetry is always uh, smaller. And therefore, not only G groups are smaller, but also H group, their local symmetries are smaller. And so the important uh, work was to look at D plus one supergravities, the way they go in D. And uh, those are examples of these supergravities. And so what uh, amplitude people basically know is that once you fix the, um, say, 56 bind in version of theory which has local SU8, then you have uh, the, the usual SU8 global. And this is what amplitudes see. And this is where you see also Marcus, he assumed when he computed the anomalies, which are rather well known in uh, amplitude community, that that was the story. And he computed the uh, anomaly of global H symmetry, SU8 in this case. However, when you go to other type of supergravities, uh, they are different. They have in particular necessarily have axions, which have polynomial dependence. And they, they just don't have this global H symmetry. So the whole issue of Marcus anomaly becomes a puzzle. And so what was in, first I saw that it's something accidental. And then I came across this paper uh, of um, Andrianopoli, Dauri, Ferrara, Fremi, Nice, and Trigiante. And it turns out that the number of these axions is abelian nilpotent ideals, 
and this is a number of translational symmetries, and therefore they are really, really different supergravity in the same dimension with the same amount of local supersymmetries, and they are absolutely not known. But this is generic for all dimensions. So uh, if we go to supergravity one, it is E77 over SU8, and supergravity two is where E77 over uh, SU8 is decomposed via the upper dimension coset, E66 over USP8, and there is also the circle dimension, and there are 27 axioms, because this is just Lie algebra. And both have the same amount of supersymmetry. And uh, accidentally, I knew about this second type long time ago when I was working uh, on extremal black holes. And so the solutions of type one give you one over eight BPS extremal black holes. And these are one group of N equals eight attractors with finite area of the horizon and finite entropy. But the other one is actually coming from supergravity two. And this is known as non BPS N equals eight extremal black holes. And they have to do with spontaneously broken and it will say supergravity uh, from a uh, much earlier time. So uh, this different gauges, let me quickly uh, tell you that. Uh, so G consists of uh, generators of H and coset, and they form specific algebra. And so symmetric gauges is when you take the uh, um, field bind in supergravity and write it down through generators of coset space and um, uh, H. And then you make a symmetric choice. And then all of them are coset generators are not in super algebra, but this is all you are left with. And all scalars are non polynomial. And so all amplitude computations fit supergravities in symmetric gauges. For example, in 4D, it is SU8. And in 6D, it is as USP4 cross USP4. Now, uh, the beautiful story here goes through Denton diagrams. And um, so Iwasawa gauges go as follows. You cut the right node uh, here, and this is what you are left with. And therefore, E7 is cut to E6, E5 is cut to e C E4. And in these gauges, therefore, the E7 is always broken and E5 is broken. And so uh, in these cases, the, um, uh, it's different because the, uh, so in, in the case of coset spaces, those are not in subalgebra. But in Iwasawa case, on the contrary, and there are also partial Iwasawa gauge, which I'll skip now, but they are important because this is what is available. And so Marcus computation of global H symmetry anomaly is relevant in symmetric gauges, but not in Iwasawa. Unless you can prove that those uh, S matrices are uh, exactly the same. And so when Iwasawa gauges, when you delete the right node, you actually have solvable algebra. And so the generators and the corresponding parameters here, the scalars which are left, they are in subalgebra. But it is always there is a nilpotent subalgebra, and therefore some of them are always polynomial because they remember the region from higher dimension. And uh, so there is some information of partial Iwasawa. Um, so let me remind you the story of E77. Uh, so Kramer and Julia in 78 discovered this symmetry, and then it came into amplitude through this famous paper, and then it became clear that the vanishing soft limit is the tool to constrain counterterms. And then it was proven uh, by these people that scale, soft scalar limit um, uh, shows that uh, it should be no UV divergences below seven loop order. And indeed, this is the known explanation as to why three loop, four loop, and five loop are 
and not UV diverging. It was not known about N equals four, uh, sorry, N equals five, because by that time the computations were made. And so with uh, Dan Friedman and Yusuke Yamada, we made the analogous uh, investigation of uh, soft scalar limit. And we found that in N equals five, L equals four, again, is not explained by is, is the analog of E77. And so this was kind of hanging in the air for a long time. Now, just um, to tell you what has the exceptional group to do with soft limit. Uh, usually the reference is like in pi in physics, but actually you can uh, look at uh, what E7 tells you, and it tells you that if you gauge fix in symmetric gauge and you say the field bind is equal to field bind dagger, then this is the solution. And you have the 70 scalars, which form a representation of SU8, or you can form uh, um, in homogeneous uh, coordinates of the coset space. And then if you look, this is the exact nonlinearly realized continuous E77 acting on this coordinate Y, and you see there is a shift. And this is why uh, even when you are at the linear level with amplitude, you should be able to shift all your 70 scalars by a constant. And so if the limit is broken, it's, a, it's forbidden, if there is no anomaly. Now, today, however, I'll talk about more symmetries than E77 because as I mentioned in particular, E77 didn't explain the analog of the um, enhanced cancellation of 82 diagrams in N equals five. So let's go to the main topic and the role of Gaillard's amino symmetries. And the, the, the first point is that SP56 is much bigger than E77. But the, the subtlety here is that it is uh, the dimension, not the difference between SP56 and E77, but the dimension of double quotient, which I'll explain, which is relevant. Okay, so this is the data from amplitudes. And the data is such that there's a constellation here explained by E7, here and here and here a consolation in n equals five. And then when we go to six dimension, same group of diagrams doesn't cancel and here is your one over epsilon. And so here's the property of the symmetries. Uh, those are chains of uh, exceptional G dualities. But if you want to add Gaiar Zumina, you add here SP56, which is huge. But then suddenly, E55 is just E55, and E33 is E33. All odd dimensions don't have electromagnetic symmetry, therefore they don't add anything. And so the question is, why E77 symmetry appears to protect so far maximal 4D supergravity from UV divergences, whereas E6, E5, E4, E3, E2 already failed to do so? And that, that is the question I'm, uh, I, I was trying to address. And the quick answer is only in 4D, a dimension of maximal duality is bigger than U duality. And therefore only in 4D, one can argue quantum equivalence of different gauges in supergravity using this symmetry implemented in the Hamiltonian pass integral because it is symplectic. So clearly Hamiltonian loves symplectic symmetries. So here is Gaiar and Zumina, and here is their story. You see in the abstract, they talk about SP2M, but somehow uh, it, was, it was not given enough attention. So what is new is here, that um, Gaiar Zumina duality, I studied in all D and I showed you nothing except in four, just none. And compare it with data 
from amplitudes, and they show you exactly the same pattern so far, unless Svi and company will do the computation and tell me something different later. So um, it is interesting that it is symplectic in 4D, but it is orthogonal, for example, in 6D. This is relevant, orthogonal is much smaller. Okay, so to, I just remind you that the difference between symmetries and the pattern of UV divergences fit, and this is just coincidence. Let's take it like that for now. Now the main point about double quotient uh, was made by uh, these people, and um, th there was this story uh, that Lagrangians engaging of maximum supergravities and they have shown that the ungauged Lagrangian are not unique and encoded in this matrix SP56 over E77 over GL28, and they explain the existence of symplectic frames in Lagrangians. And so just to quickly tell you, everybody may have heard about quotient or G modular H, and this is a corset, and double uh, just means that you have a uh, algebra and then you take out the generators of these two. That's all in terms of counting. However, you still have to count them and you don't know a priori. Um, so they have shown it in 4D. And in 4D, it is for uh, N equals 8, 6, uh, uh, and 5. Uh, this is a formula. So there is this SP, this is a number of vectors divided by the number, uh, sorry, taking, take out G duality. And this, you can just uh, change variables with vectors because duality acts on field strengths, not on vectors. In particular for N equals eight, it is SP 56 over E77 over GL 28 because there are 28 vectors. And it is non-trivial only in 4D. And so now this is kind of a summary of information I had to digest in my mind uh, to put things together uh, with regard to all this story. First of all, I learned in my early days from people like Fadiev, Frat, Kintutin, Battalion, and Heno how to build a pass integral, Lagrangian as well as Hamiltonian. Secondly, there was Gaillard Zumino duality. Then there was the fact that because of this abelian ideal, there is always D plus one supergravity going into D and it's totally different because there are axions. So just unrecognizable. To have them to give you exactly the same as matrix, you need a miracle, which in particular is this enhanced dualities. Then uh, the important step was Heno, Julia, Leke, Ranchbar, Hamiltonian formulation of duality. So duality uh, work, uh, they act on field strengths. You cannot use them as change of variables, except when you go to Hamiltonian, which makes it all uh, nice and consistent. Then I added Bernet all computation the way they are now. And then there was my recent work, including how to build the pass integral. And um, when I combined all of these, the answer was those symmetries explain things the way we know them now. And in particular, all, diver all UV divergences in higher dimensions are there because all the UV divergences are at the loop below critical. So they tell me H symmetry and G symmetry are anomalous and I don't have uh, extra dualities to protect them. So it is consistent as of now. For example, in D equals six, which is a three loop, famous three loop divergence, the corresponding quotient is trivial because um, SO55 in E55 is exactly the same group. 
And therefore, there is no proof in higher D that you can um, say at any gauge in version supergravity one or two, they must be on shell equivalent. Okay, this is just a reminder that the way duality works, it doesn't work on the field, but on the field strengths. Therefore, and there is something called electric group and symplectic frames, which I'll have to skip. And so um, this double quotient space allows you extra symmetries, which bring you from one Lagrangian to the other Lagrangian, and they are different. Lagrangians are not unique. Our S matrix is unique. And the proof at the classical level was given by the people which I told you about. And so the classical result of David uh, Santleben and Trigiante was <clears throat> that um, you can uh, use this double quotient and scan all different, what it means, zero? Okay, so, uh, okay, I'll just um, leave you with that. So these are final, uh, work, which is just one slide, which, which is uh, uh, incredibly beautiful. So if you take the Lagrangian, no way to build the pass integral. You go to the Hamiltonian, and this is what you do. And then suddenly you have a pass integral, which I want to show you, which is manifestly SP56 invariant, just a canonical change of variable. Now, the most important issue is that it is a local change of variables and therefore this change is a local uh, measure of integration delta four of zero and it doesn't give you finite contribution there was a long story of people debating whether one should keep it or not and i think in dimensional regularization is just not there and now i want to ask you to compare this with fujikawa you do the change of variables, you have a finite contribution. That is different. And I think I am um, about to say, um, yeah, let me show you this slide. So the crucial test was, is the double quotient for n equals five uh, non-trivial? <laughs> and yes, there is still a good amount of symmetries in the double quotient so that 82 diagrams cancel. So enhanced duality explains enhanced cancellation and absence of enhanced duality is consistent with UV divergences in D equals six. And uh, let me just show you exactly one slide, <laughs> sorry. So uh, Paul Ehrenfest, long time ago suggested that D equals four is special in gravity because planet, this is the only dimension where planets have a stable planetary motion. Now, if somebody keep computing D equals four higher loop order UV divergences and will not find them, then it will be because of the special symmetries. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very nice talk. I think we have time for just one question before we move on. <coughs> so, Renato, you, you said that this uh, SP56 is just the uh, ro electric magnetic rotation on the 28 vectors? Uh the SP56. I can't hear you. Sorry, the SP56 the, is the electric magnetic rotation on the 28 vectors? Yes. And uh, Yes, so if you just change variables for scalars and for vectors, although Lagrangian looks differently, but you bring it back. But it doesn't have any action on the on the perturbative amplitudes, does it? Oh, yeah. What to do with amplitudes, I don't know yet, because remember, E77, the fact that amplitudes see it through soft limit was not immediate. So here, I don't know yet. 
you see the consequence, like in amplitudes, you just don't know why 82 diagrams cancel. This is a possible explanation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thanks very much.